Hello and welcome to the 16th episode of Season 3 of the Educational Duct Tape Podcast. This is the 80th episode of the show and the 57th regular episode. Today, Dr. Monica Burns will be joining me to share some of her strategies for hearing from all students, including empowering students with choice and agency, removing barriers, and using tools like Seesaw, Book Creator, Padlet, and Google Slides. Let's get to it. I'm AJ Bianco, host of Reflect Ed, a part of the Education Podcast Network. Just like the show you're listening to now, shows on the network are individually owned and opinions expressed may not reflect others. Find other interesting education podcasts at edupodcastnetwork.com. Welcome to the Educational Duct Tape Podcast with Jake Miller. Hello, welcome in. My name is Jake and I'm here to talk to you about duct tape and educational technology and how the two fit together to form a goofy metaphor, but also an ed tech integration mindset that I believe can make the selection of tech tools for your learning environment a little bit less stressful. I'm also here to share with you a really insightful and fun interview with EdTech and curriculum consultant, author, and former New York City public school teacher, Dr. Monica Burns. Monica's background in the classroom combined with her work on the Class Tech Tips blog and her Easy EdTech podcast and her posts on all the social media channels that I could possibly think of and her awesome books makes her overqualified as a guest on my show. And I'm so eager to share her insights with you. A few things before we get to that, though. First up, stickers. With us starting to get back into our schools and someday in the future at conferences and professional developments, it's time to start showing off our duct taper status with some stickers. If you'd like to get some podcast stickers for yourself or to hand some out at an upcoming event, head to jakemiller.net slash stickers. I owe some stickers to a handful of folks. If you're one of those people, sorry. I promise you're on my list and I'm going to get them out there. But while I'm preparing to send out that pile of stickers that I owe to some people, it's perfect timing to add your name to that list. So if you'd like some stickers, head over to jakemiller.net slash send me stickers. By the way, don't worry. I promise I won't lick the envelope seal. (laughs) But if you head to that link, I can send you some stickers for yourself or to even hand out in an event. Next up, it's calendar time. No, not like in first grade where you sing the Days of the Week song to the tune of the Adams Family theme. (laughs) Days of the Week. 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 There's Monday and there's... Sorry. Uh, (laughs) Calendar time is not that. That's not calendar time. It's the time where I tell you what's coming up on my calendar. And so spring in the next couple months is actually a little slow for me in terms of presentations, uh, which is okay because it's not slow for me in terms of my day-to-day job as an eighth grade science teacher and my rest of the time job as a father of three and husband of one. Uh, but it is slow for me in spring in terms of presentations, but I will make up for it and then some in June because in June, uh, we'll be kicking off the 10th and final, I promise, for real, final cohort of my virtual course called Best Practices and Tools for Learning in All Settings. If you'd like to learn how to use Flipgrid and Screencastify or Loom, Edpuzzle and Pear Deck or Nearpod in your classes, listen up. It is a seven-week experience that kicks off on June 20th and wraps up on August 10th. It's 12.5 contact hours. There's about two hours of work for each week of the course, but it's all asynchronous, so you can choose when you do it. I've been so proud of the feedback that I've received for this course. There's been like 200 um, participants so far. I don't have the number in front of me right now, uh, and I've been so proud of the feedback I've gotten from them, but I've been even prouder of what those 200 or so educators have accomplished um, through doing the work in this course. I've been so, so proud of them. You can get details uh, for the course at jakemiller.net slash KSU course 2020. And I get, and yes, I know that is the wrong year, but we thought this would just be a 2020 course, but it has gone so well that we just keep running it. And it's now 2021 and I'm still teaching a course that has 2020 in the URL. And I just don't feel like changing it, guys. But the plan was just for to do it once and it's gone really well. So that, that's great. Uh, also uh, in June, so that, so that kicks off on June 20th uh, and right around that same time, 
I will be doing the keynote at the summit at Murray State. I will be doing the keynote or one of the keynotes for the WitCon conference and a keynote at the Panhandle STEM conference. I am super excited for these. And that's not all. There are a few other events in June and July that are still in the works. I can't wait to tell you guys about them, but there's some more things coming too. Finally, if you've got an event coming up, I would love, 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 love to be a part of it, whether it's on a stage or on a screen. My favorite thing to do is speak to and work with educators. So if you're planning an event, please head over to jakemiller.net slash speaking to see some speaking videos and submit an inquiry. I'll uh, send you an email. We'll set up a phone call. We'll chit chat about uh, whatever it is you have in mind for me. It sounds like fun already. Uh, You haven't even told me yet, and I'm excited about it. Look at me. I'm getting giddy just thinking about whatever you're going to message me about. I'm so excited. jakemiller.net slash speaking. Oh, sorry. Hold on. Let me just grab my soapbox from over here. Uh, uh, There we go. That's perfect. Climb up on there. Jib Jab Hot Dog Shop in Girard, Ohio makes the best chili dogs. If I'm in the area, I've got to grab a few. (laughs) Even if I'm not hungry. Even, (laughs) Even if I just ate dinner. I'll regret it if I don't get at least one. If I don't, I'll be thinking about those chili dogs for days because I live about 45 minutes away, so I can't just make a trip when I want. And so if I'm nearby and I don't get them, I'm going to think about it for weeks until I'm next in the area and get one. So I've just got to get at least one while I'm in the area. So last week, two of those chili dogs cost me a few hours of my time and at least $10 worth of gasoline, which is impressive since they're like $1.04 a piece. Uh, <laughs> So I was in the neighborhood running an errand that took me to my parents' house, even though I had just enjoyed some homemade roast beef and mashed potatoes and corn for my parents, with my parents, I still felt the need to stop by for a few dogs to take home. It was evening. It was a school night. I had time to make it back home. I had some work to do. The trash had to get out. I had a lot of stuff to do, uh, but I was like, you know what? I'm going to take the extra five minutes. I'm going to swing by Jib Jab. I'm going to get two chili dogs. I'm going to scarf one down in the car, and then I'm going to have one after I get home. And those of you who met me in person, you're like, Jake, how how are you so skinny when you have two, two chili dogs late in the evening after all this? Like, I, I really I really don't know. I'm, I'm blessed with great metabolism and um, goofy things to talk about on podcasts. But anyhow, I digress. <laughs> so anyhow, I went to Jib Jab. The drive through line was so long that I decided to order inside. You know that feeling when you're like, you look at the last car in the line that you would have been behind, and you're like, all right, it ends with a white Mazda Miata. I don't know, I'm making that up. Uh, (laughs) And then you go inside, and you're like, I just hope I make it out before that car, because then I could be like, yes. So I went in, I rode my two dogs, I waited around for a little bit, I looked at Twitter while I waited for them to make them, and then I walked back out and walked to my car. I saw that I had gotten out of the store before that Mazda Miata, or whatever it was, again, making that car name up, uh, got up to the drive-thru, so I had that moment where I was like, yes, I did it. And I was so excited to celebrate that success by by plopping down in the car and eating that first chili dog while I started the 40-minute drive home, but my excitement about beating that car through the drive through where to get my chili dogs uh, quickly went away. I had locked my keys in the car. Now, this is not what the technology was supposed to do. You're not supposed to be able to lock a key fob in a car. The car and the keys are supposed to know better. It couldn't have been user error right? (laughs) So that it was true. They were locked in. There was nothing I could do. I could potentially call a locksmith and wait for an hour for them to come out and pay $50 for them to maybe get the car unlocked and maybe not. But instead, I borrowed my dad's car, drove home, got our extra key, drove back, got my car and drove home again. Hours later, I was finally home after my intended bedtime uh, and hours after I had planned to start writing my weekly email to my mailing list subscribers. So there was no email the next morning because uh, my jib jab chili dog keys locked in the car uh, debacle ruined my email writing time. But the chili dogs were good. You know, probably not worth an extra hour and a half of driving, but they were good. So I had to be flexible. I had to focus on my goal. And I had to just send out the email late. I made it the next day in the evening after work ended that day. I sent it out late. It's not the ideal time for me to send out an email. It's not when the people that subscribe are used to receiving them. But I was flexible. I had a goal. I had an outcome that I was striving for. And I had to select a response that got me there, right? I talk about E plus R equals O on the show a lot. I had an event 
right? I was planning to write an email. I screwed things up by locking my keys in the car at the hot dog shop. I got home so late I couldn't write the email, but I had an outcome, which was I wanted to get that email out before the weekend. So I chose a new response, which was to write the email after school. That's what I had to do. Sometimes our ed tech integrations go about as smoothly as my chili dog mission went. The next day, I tried a new tool for an assessment. This is a total coincidence, but the next day in school, I'm probably a little extra tired because of the whole chili dog excitement the night before, um, and I was giving an assessment, and I decided to try a new tool. The tool that I had been using previously to that um, was like a gas station hot dog, not a jib jab chili dog. It was like a gas station hot dog, you know, the ones on the rollers that are like rolling around, and you know how many days or hours they've been there. <laughs> It, it was technically a assessment tool, just like those hot dogs are technically hot dogs, but it wasn't um, meeting my needs, just like those <laughs> um, <laughs> gross gas station hot dogs. So I needed a change. And this new tool that I thought you know was the right answer had the potential to be as awesome as a jib jab chili dog because they are awesome, but it did not go well. I asked the kids for feedback, and they agreed. They said, Mr. Miller, this, this was not good. Uh, it, it, it was not up to par. Some of the kids were like, it was okay, but I could tell. I could tell. I could tell. And some of them were, were straight up honest. It was stressful, they said. So I knew I had to change. You could say that I had locked the metaphorical keys in the metaphorical car. I guess you could. You probably wouldn't, but you could. Something that had potential to have been perfect, like those chili dogs, had turned out to be a big inconvenience, like locking my keys in the car. So after spending hours prepping that assessment, and it really was hours, I had to scramble and rebuild it in a different tool before using it in my other three class periods. So I was now on to my third tool. I was frustrated, and I didn't want to do it, but I had to be flexible. I had to be solution-focused. All told, I probably spent more time on that assessment debacle than I did on the chili dog mission. And the next new assessment tool that I tried, the third thing, it worked better. Just like the chili dogs, the new tool was good. And just like the chili dogs, I wish that I could have skipped over the extra time in the middle. But you know what? It happens. Things don't go according to plan. So we take a deep breath. We think on our feet. We identify a new path forward. And then we get through it but we learn from it. The eyes that are watching us, by the way, my kids who talked to me on the phone during my extra driving time that night, and my students who saw me ask for feedback and then scramble to chart a new path with that assessment tool, they learn from it too. They watch how I reacted in those situations and they observe and they pay attention and they will probably follow the model that I set for them, which I'm actually pretty proud of the way I handled both situations. And so that's what we do. We reflect, we take that deep breath, we think on our feet, we're flexible, we identify our new path forward, and we get through it. And hopefully, in the meantime, we enjoy the chili dogs. Mm -hmm. Chili dogs. Today's guest. All right, today my guest is Dr. Monica Burns. Monica is an ed tech and curriculum consultant, author, and former New York City public school teacher, and works with schools and organizations around the world. Monica's website, classtechtips.com, and her easy ed tech podcast help educators place tasks before apps by promoting deeper learning with technology. You could find all of Monica's work and follow her on all of the social medias on Twitter and on Facebook and on Pinterest and on Instagram at Class Tech Tips. And you want to check out that Easy Ed Tech podcast as well. But here live with you today is Monica Burns. Welcome in, Monica. Thank you so much for having me today. Excited to be here with you. Yeah, I'm super excited. I've been following the work you do, Monica, for, for quite some time, listening to your podcast, following you. You're, you're beating me on... Um, on Instagram and on TikTok with the shares on there, but I've been uh, eagerly enjoying the stuff that you share on there. So it's about time uh, to get you here on the, on the podcast. Mm -hmm. Thanks for being here. Um, all of those social medias, what's your, what's your favorite one? Gosh, I mean, Twitter has a special place in my heart because that's where I first started connecting and sharing Same. with different people. But Instagram has been a lot of fun. Just being able to post and share pictures feels a little bit more personal. Uh -huh. And it's been a fun place to just learn about other people's work too. 
I want all of them to go away except for Twitter. <laughs> like, can I just, just please just focus on Twitter and make sure everything else go away. But I know, like, you know, like if you want to support educators, like your bio said right there, um, helping educators place tasks before apps by promoting deeper learning. You got to find all the educators, right? And they're not all on Twitter. Some of them are on Insta and some of them are on Pinterest and some are on Facebook. You got to find them in all the places, right? Yeah, absolutely. And it's been an interesting first you know, chunk of the year, if you will, um, using Clubhouse as just another place oh, yeah. on the list, right, to connect with educators. And so that's been fun. It feels like some of that early energy from Twitter that I felt, you know, about 10 years or so ago now, mm -hmm. reconnecting with people that I used to have Twitter chats with, now having these audio conversations. So I was feeling like you with, oh, no, here's another thing on my right. list of social spots. But I found a lot of value in it recently. And just like all the things you're kind of excited to see where it lands. Yeah, that's, that's a good point, too. I, I, I have been like, nope, no, thanks. I'm like, I, can't, I just can't even add Clubhouse on right now. But you did a great post uh, about Clubhouse. I think I, I'll grab that link and put in the show notes for people because if they're like, what is Clubhouse? Or uh, like some, some educators probably have not even heard of it. So you did a great post. What, what site was that post on? That wasn't on your site. That was on on EdSearch. Yeah. So I did one on EdSearch that gives kind of an overview of what it is. And then mm -hmm. on my blog, uh, Lisa Dabbs and Tisha Poncio, we do a room on Tuesday afternoons. And so I did a roundup of some of our favorite tips on there too. Nice. Great. Well, I'll show that stuff in the show notes so people can check it out and learn more about it. That's a little, little bonus tip. They don't normally get a tip here at the beginning, <laughs> but when when the, the woman behind classtechtips.com comes on, there there's going to be plenty of tips flying around, right? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> yep. I, I got to tell you, reading your your uh, bio there made me a little jealous of the, the former New York City public school teacher part. New York City is one of my favorite places in the world. Um, my sister used to live there. She lived in Queens, and my wife and I would go visit her like like four or five times a year spend the weekend there and go bopping around downtown um but since we've had kids there's no no new york city trips in our in our life someday someday we'll get them there um do, do, are you still in new york city or or no longer so I'm outside of New York City. I'm in Jersey City right now, which okay. is kind of like Brooklyn, but on the Jersey side of the river is how I explain mm. it to people. Um, so I lived and lived in Manhattan for about 10 years, taught for yeah. about a little shy of seven in the city. I grew up on Long Island, so native New Yorker, although my license does say New Jersey now, but it's been a couple years, so just dealing yeah. with that. Uh, but <laughs> loved uh, living in the city, loved teaching in the city, and um, love that I'm still so close by. Yeah, yeah, I miss it. I, one of my favorite things, I'm such a nerd. I don't know what this says about my personality, but one of my favorite parts about New York City was navigating the subway. Like, I found it so interesting. My my wife would be like taking a nap on the subway car as we'd be going to wherever we were going shopping or exploring or to dinner or whatever. And I'd be like, we're going to get off at the L train over here and then we're going to have to switch over to the. And then I'd be like, wait a minute, I think we missed our stop. <laughs> Me looking at my giant map. <laughs> it's so funny that you say that, Jake, because, you know, having commuted in the city for so long, having lived in the city for so long. Um, when I moved to New Jersey, even though it's very much a city, like a walkable spot where I live, you know, you get back into Manhattan, you're just like, you lose your, you lose your whole right. sense of like having to think about things where you're like, oh, right. I need to make sure I don't miss my stop or I don't have that same muscle memory <laughs> that I had right, built. Right. Right. Yeah. So for me driving to work or whatever, like get, just get off of that exit, right. You know where to go, but on the, on the subway, it's, it's a lot to think about, a lot to manage. <laughs> we were trying to explain it to our kids the other day. And my wife was saying, well, like you get on and you know where you're going to go. And then you hear a guy come over the loudspeaker and he kind of sounds like, <laughs> and they're like, how do you know? And you're like, you just hope you're right. right, right. You just leave early forever trying to get to. Yeah, and my kids are like, I don't know. I don't know if I want to try that. <laughs> Good life skills, though. Good practice, you know. <laughs> that, that is for sure. That's for sure. Okay. So even though we're already laughing about our, our life skills and our New York City uh, experiences, I um, would like to play a game with you up for a game. Um, all the way. Yeah, let's do okay. it. Two truths and one lie. We're going to start with a game of two truths and one lie. I hope I haven't ru ruined any of your statements by spoiling your your New York and, and New Jersey uh, and Long Island heritage. I hope that's not in there, but let's see. Let's see if you can stump me with your two truths and one lie here. All right. So let's get started. The first one is that I've been to all 50 states. Okay. The second is that I have my Girl Scout Gold Award. And my third is that I met Bill Murray at the airport. 
Oh gosh, those are three good statements. So the I, I know you you travel a lot because you've been doing some some awesome presentations over the years. So that's believable. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, 50 is a lot. Mm-hmm. But I'm gonna, I, I, I'm, I can believe that one. Bill Murray, that'd be so cool to meet Bill Murray. He would probably be the weirdest celebrity to meet because he must be really odd in person to talk to, like sarcastic. And then Girl Scout Gold Award. I'd be, I've never heard of a Girl Scout Gold Award. My, my daughter didn't get past the brownies or the daisies or something like that. But um, I believe, I believe you're, you're very organized and you get stuff done, Monica. So I'm believing the Gold Scout Gold <laughs> Award. So my guess is that your lie is meeting Bill Murray. I met Bill Murray at the Minneapolis airport <laughs> about five or six years ago on my way to Mount Rushmore. So that is a true statement <laughs> and a magical quite- America day for me. <laughs> <laughs> That's quite a story. I was traveling from New Jersey through Minneapolis, going to Mount Rushmore mm-hmm. and met Bill Murray, who wasn't yeah. in Chicago, right? Isn't he a nope. Chicago guy? He's, uh, like, yeah. He was in Minneapolis. <laughs> yeah. And did he was he was he chatty or was it a very quick like, hello, I'm Bill Murray, goodbye? <laughs> so I was going through security and TSA pre-check was taking long. I was on my phone. I rarely am in heels at the airport, but I had run from an event. And so I go through security, you know, throw my stuff, my heels go off on the metal detector. So I run back, throw them on, turn, and there's Bill Murray, who is much taller than you might think. But the funny thing is that my dad looks a lot like Bill Murray. (laughs) And so I did a double take wondering why my dad was at the airport. (laughs) And then I look again and realize that's Bill Murray. So we got, (laughs) yeah, so we got stuck as they were doing a bag check, just him and me and another woman in front. Um, going through security and he was just making fun of everyone. Like, you know, when you put your hands up and the spinny thing, you know, making fun of the woman that was in there, just being so silly and friendly and pretty much everything you would want <laughs> from a oh chance. My gosh. <laughs> I can't believe he was like that. I, I expected him to be like, I don't know, like sarcastic and I don't, I don't know, but like for him to be kind of like a showman in that situation, that's pretty funny. Yeah. And for them to not just like sweep him right through there and make sure that he had a pleasant oh, yeah. experience. I'd be like, that, that's Bill Murray. Let him go through. Let the man pass. He right. was by himself. Couldn't have been any nicer. And then about an hour later, I got on a plane to Rapid City, South Dakota and saw Mount Rushmore. So it was a very yes. funny afternoon. <laughs> wow. Yeah, that's quite a day. That's uh-huh. quite a day. Bill Murray. What's your favorite Bill Murray movie? On the, oh on the spot. That is an on the spot question. I probably Groundhog Day. I'm not sure if Groundhog I could. Day. Yeah, yeah, I love that movie. I think yeah, I think I think I'm Ghostbusters, but Groundhog Day is definitely up there. And then I like I like his newer kind of like the newer like stuff he does where it's really like that quirky quirky style but still i'm getting off off task here I, i'm getting off tasks before apps here monica yeah. <laughs> i i have not identified your lie yet okay so you're you're giving me extra belief in the 50 states thing here by by you already named like three states in that story right there so i think i think your lie is the girl scout gold award so I have my Girl Scout Gold Award, oh. an Eagle Scout for Boy Scouts, if you want to okay. find that equivalency there, um, that I earned in high school. Yeah. So oh. I'm shy of my 50 states. Um, about, I want to say I'm at maybe 42 or 43. Uh, oh. I won't do the whole count for you, but I've still got a few to go. Well, we should put a list in the in the show notes so that every <laughs> like the, the educators from those states can get get on their districts to to yeah. get you to come there, right? Mm-hmm. Complete your fifty. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I'm guessing that your your project for the gold award are there projects like there are for Eagle Scouts? Yeah. Mm-hmm. I'm I'm guessing that it was an ebook about Adobe Spark. <laughs> Gosh, you're great. I could do. I mean, it's so funny to think about all the things that you could do. And I had such a like a fangirl moment when the Girl Scouts like liked one of my retweets when they had oh. released all these virtual reality badges. But my project was all about. There's an organization called Warm Up America. If you've heard okay. of them before, uh, people can use like yarn scraps and you make rectangles and you ship it to them and they stitch them all together to make blankets for homeless shelters and different places. So, um, I have not been making any scarves or anything fun in quite some time, but in high school I made a whole bunch, collected a whole bunch, and that was my big project. 
Oh, that's cool. That's a cool story. I I I was wrong. It was not an ebook. No, no tech friendly. <laughs> make those now. Right? Yeah, no tech friendly stuff for that that part of my life. I guess. <laughs> class class tech tips was was knitting yarn instead of. Yeah. Instead but in of a cool making. way. But in a cool way, right? Very yeah. cool. Very cool. And service project minded. Mm-hmm. That's awesome. Okay, so now that we've been talking about scarves and yarn and Girl Scouts and States and Bill Murray and Mount Rushmore, let's get into some educational technology, especially since you didn't help me out by making an ebook for your Girl Scout Gold Project. Now we really <laughs> got to get to the educational technology. So my educational duct tape question for you is, I actually, I guess I should tell people in case they're new listeners what an educational duct tape question is. So educational duct tape is my silly metaphor and ed tech integration mindset that says we think about and this is very similar to what was in your bio and what's the title of one of your books and as a lot of what you talk about is that we think about educational technology not as the focus of a lesson or not as the thing we're trying to do but as a tool that helps us meet a goal or address a learning standard or solve a need so kind of like you say with tasks before apps you think about what is it i'm trying to do what is it i want my students to do first before i identify the apps that we're going to use for it so that's kind of the idea here And so I think I've got a good tasks before apps question for you here. And that is, how can I hear from all of my students? And this is an interesting question, especially in 2021 right now, as most educators are, you know, in some variety of situations where maybe all of their students aren't even in the classroom with them. So what are some ways we could use technology to hear from all of our students? Yeah, it's a big question, right, that we can look at from a few different angles. So overarching, right, with it, you know, I like to think about choice. And so giving kids choice and options is always going to be the best way to hear from everyone. And that might be some guided choice, like options for students based on the same sort of decisions you might make for differentiated instruction in the past. It might be choice in how they share, whether they choose to record their voice or you give them options to draw something or to type something out. So when it comes to hearing from everyone, it's really about setting them up for success with options, whether those are options that you have made the decision, this is the option for that student, or whether you're giving them a little bit more agency to say, this is how I want to share the story of my learning. And so when we're talking about you know this past year, and what it means to hear from everyone, the choice and options is a big part of that. But considering how the different learning models are, different delivery models from this past year, you know, there may be a layer of asynchronous and synchronous options that go along mm-hmm. with that too. So giving kids an opportunity to share, to let you let you hear their voice at a time that works for them or within the constraints of a synchronous learning experience, right? That can look a little bit different than we would have talked about together um, last year. Yeah, that's a good point. I love the point of the choice in here because if we want to hear from all of our students, but we only give them one way to express their thinking or their understanding to us, we're not letting them all be comfortable. And still, I I always like to remind educators that any steps we're taking towards increasing whatever part of our practice is good. But if we're only like if we're sending out something and letting them all respond with text, well, it's better than not sending it out at all. But we are leaving some students in a situation where they might not want to type that or they might be slow typers or they might struggle with getting their words on um, words into whatever format we wanted in that way. So giving them some choice in how they're going to do that, that, that is huge. That's a great point. What are some tools you like to use for that? Yeah. So for me, when I think about this, you know, it also comes down to removing some of the barriers for students. And so tools that allow more students to participate, right, is part of that question. So it might be utilizing a tool you're already using, which is always the best case scenario, right, to leverage tools you and your students. I say you, meaning teachers listening and students um, already are using. So if you're in a space like Seesaw, maybe it's more purposefully introducing the different options for students students to respond or spending that extra time saying, here's another way for you to explain to me how you solve this math problem. Or if you're in a tool like Book Creator, I love Book Creator and I've done some work with their team. You know, you might encourage students to choose, am I going to leave an audio response? Am I going to record a video? Am I going to snap a picture of my illustration? And just continuously remind them that all of those are valued responses and that all of them are right or the correct way to answer the question because 
I'm sure in your experience as well, you know, you've worked with students who can tell you all the things about something, but the minute they have that pencil in their hand or the keyboard in front of them, right, their confidence level lowers. You know, I worked in a classroom with a lot of students um, who were learning English as a second language, who were conversationally proficient in English, which was my primary, my only language of instruction, right, at that time. And so for them, if they could explain to me all the ways different triangles, you know, were different from one another, but if they were going to sit down and write me a paragraph of how they could tell the difference between an isosceles and a scalene triangle, right? That writing part of the day was not one that they were as excited about. And doesn't mean it doesn't happen. It just means we give some extra steps, some extra opportunities to talk and share before that extra piece comes into play. Oh, that's a great point there and helping them prepare for that. So you, you gave two different examples there, which are actually two of my favorite tools out there in educational technology. One uh, that you mentioned was Seesaw. And I find that a lot of educators, unless they're elementary educators, are not super familiar with Seesaw. And first of all, it's 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 an any age tool for sure. Like it would be fantastic in a high school classroom. Um, but also e- even in the elementary classrooms, a lot of educators are not familiar with it. Could you kind of break down what, what Seesaw is? Yeah, absolutely. So Seesaw is essentially a space where you can push out activities or assignments to students. So it could be kind of a one-off, less formal or more formal of an activity with an uh, exemplar, clear instructions, all those things. So there's a differentiation option for assigning things to different students. So that's kind of the teacher role. And then with a student view, students can either respond to an assignment or upload something more organically. And you can decide if the other students can see it or if there's moderation, right? So some of those uh, typical features, but students can do a few different things. They can snap a picture, record a video, draw a picture, or even create a video of them drawing a picture, which can give you a lot of insight too. And they of course can respond with text or adding a link or even uploading or adding a file from another spot. So it sounds like a lot to hand to a kindergarten or first grader, but you can make the most of the tool um, when it comes to introducing and setting up kids for success. And I'm so glad, Jake, you mentioned about it not just being elementary, because when I've talked to high school educators who maybe are in a space like Teams or Schoology Mm -hmm. or Google Classroom, right, they are looking for maybe something that's going to help three or four of their students, not all of their students. And Seesaw might be something that is supplemental for a group too, where you just have a couple students who use this thing because there's a lot of extra features for the voice and the audio recording piece. Yeah. And it's, so it's great for everybody to use, or it could be kind of that supplement there. And the nice thing about it in comparison to like like me, uh, Teams or Schoology or Classroom, like you mentioned, is that it's it's like a LMS, kind of like those. It's like a, I, I always say it's like Google Classroom mixed with a digital portfolio, mixed with parent communication too, too because there's also that parent communication backend mm-hmm. where the parents can see what the students are doing, um, and the students can choose. As you mentioned, there the students can either be responding to a assignment that the teacher made, or they could just say like, "This is something that I'm proud of." based on whatever ground rules you have set, this is something that I'm proud of and I want to post it here. And then the teacher sees it and then the parent sees it too. So the student starts to actually take some ownership over their growth there too. Absolutely. And there's so many ways that you could introduce something like this, different expectations you might have. And I'm sure you get the question a lot too. I get this a lot from teachers when I'm leading you know, a webinar or talking about uh, different tools together, right? You don't need all the things, right? You might if you're already in Google Classroom, do you need a Seesaw? Well, you might need it for a couple of your students right. who have that extra layer of voice or choice or extra ways for them to respond. There's a lot of complementary aspects of using something like Seesaw. So for some schools, it's the Google Classroom. I'm doing air quotes here, right? right. The Google Classroom for their K2 students, and then everyone else is in Google Classroom. But I don't think that it has to be an either or. Um, it really depends on your environment, what your goals yeah. are, and if you're really going to use some of the particular aspects of a tool like that one. Yeah, you could potentially use it to replace a tool like Google Classroom, but I think you're right. It, it, depending on how you want to use it, and 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 like we were saying earlier, what your goal is or what your task is, like you said, um, maybe there's reason to use both of them. Maybe there's there's reason for both. And I think one of my favorite things about Seesaw is 
So like I, I, I use Pear Deck a lot in my daily practice mm-hmm. as an educator and I love Pear Deck and it, it's a good answer to this question too. It, it does let me hear from all my students, but one of the downsides of Pear Deck and I, I'm like splitting hairs because it is a favorite tool of mine is that I can have my students either reply with text or f- answer a multiple choice question or reply with a drawing or like, like it's, it's kind of like one thing at a time, right? Yeah. Unless I embed another tool into it. But uh-huh. with Seesaw, they have that choice. Like you said, they could choose, I'm going to just draw or I'm going to use text or I'm going to use text and I'm going to record audio over it, explaining what I said here. It gives the students a lot of power and which, which also then, uh, as you said earlier, if we give the kids that choice and that agency, that increases your ability to hear them. Not, not only are you giving them an opportunity to share their thinking or their understanding or whatever, but you're going to be able to better under, the better uh, evaluate their comprehension or hear from them if they have some power over how they respond. You know, Absolutely. And there's just a level of intention that needs to be there too, yeah. right? So if we are asking a question, we need to know what it is that we want to hear and be able to say, if I hear this, this is what I'm going to do. If I hear this, this is what I'm going to do. Because essentially, right, these are formative assessment opportunities, even if we don't use that language all the time, right? We are observing what students have done. We're asking them a question intentionally. And so we know what we need to see in order to be confident that we can move forward or adjust instruction. And so I love the Pear Deck example you gave, right? Because you can embed these touch points, right, in between Uh, a lesson, whether it's something that's self-paced, where having those check-ins are really important. If you can't read the room or ask a question on the fly, you want to be able to hear from students frequently, right? With that consistency built into an activity that you have set up, but then also give them some different ways, right? Some different options for how to respond. Yeah. And then book creator, similar to that, right? Where it's not, it doesn't have that kind of like LMS feel or digital portfolio feel like, like uh, Seesaw does, but book creator gives so many different things a, a, a student can uh, can put into response. I think I, I did a blog post about it a, a couple like earlier in the fall and the blog post was 16 types of media you can add in book, book Creator. And I think now it's more than 16. I think they've added more things in there, but it's the same going back to what you originally said, which was, um, you know, giving the kids choice. They could respond with a video. They could respond with some audio. They could respond with a picture. They could respond with a drawing. They could put in some some images from the internet or they could do a combination of them. Yeah, there's just so much you can do. And, um, you know, I love all the things around Book Creator. I mentioned, you know, I've been connected and done some work with their team for a long time now. And so it's been just, which one of the benefits of that is you see this growth, right, of mm-hmm. what things looked like um, a while back and now what things look like now. And so one of my favorite ways to think about the choice aspect within that particular tool is, you know, as a classroom teacher, like many classroom teachers, right, my students had composition or marble notebooks. I would ask them to put them in a pile before we went to lunch or transition, right? So I could go through and kind of see what everyone was working on and give some feedback and check in. And so I love Book Creator from a culminating project, right? Or let's publish all of our poetry, right? So many Mm -hmm. things you could do. But I also like it from an everyday journal standpoint, because you can set up a library, invite your kids in, they've got Mm. their math journal or science journal, and you can just go and take a peek and you can add a voice feedback. There's transcription built in too. So there's both options. You could add a video feedback or just circle something with the pen tool and kids can leave it or delete it or whatever feels good. So I just like that communication channel and, you know, pre um, remote learning. So pre pandemic, I was working with a group of educators who had worked with for several years up in, up in New York. And so with them, you know, we were doing book creator with their fourth grade classroom um, to do a few different things, to publish writing, to um, do do a couple different social studies activities. But one of the things we had was this ability for the teacher on one side of the room to kind of see everyone's books in real time, right? So that was great from a physical classroom setting. She could get a chance to take a look at everyone's stuff. But then when you transition to remote learning, right, you have that same ability to peek in everyone's journals, even if you don't have a stack of them all together in the classroom. So I just love the choice aspect, the ability to hear 
from all students, but I think it's important to emphasize how the logistics come into play, right? It, these all, all these things are great, but how are you going to make it happen? I think both Seesaw has a really great dashboard for teachers for the organizational piece. Um, Book Creator does as well. And I know tools like Pear Deck right, allow you to get a lot of insights from students mm-hmm. no matter where they are. Support for this episode comes from, well, it's actually from me, or kind of. I actually just want to take this opportunity to tell you about my favorite company to get custom stickers from. I've tried a handful of companies over the years, and I've actually been pleased with all of them, but one company gets A pluses across the board. Sticker quality, prices, deals, customer service, shipping speed, sense of humor of their advertising, everything. They're just great. And that company is Sticker Mule. And they do more than just stickers. Seriously, I have educational duct tape pins, keychains, packing envelopes, packing tape, and they've got other things available too even their own Sticker Mule brand hot sauce. So if you've got some sticker needs, head to jakemiller.net slash sticker mule. That's S-T-I-C-K-E-R-M-U-L-E to order some stickers. And if this is your first time ordering, you'll get $10 off just by using that link. And full disclosure, I'll get $10 credit, which I'll actually probably use for some hot sauce. Yeah, I think I need some. That's jakemiller.net slash sticker mule. When you were saying about Book Creator, I just kind of had this moment where I was like, oh, wow, I didn't even think about that because I was uh, last week doing a um, kind of collaborative session uh, or kind of like a workshop session with the school district of teachers who were just preparing for concurrent learning. They hadn't started concurrent right. learning. It was a week away or something. I was talking about my takeaways and I, we were talking about how they really had to identify what is it that they're trying to do because it's not the same for everybody. What, what are you, what's your pain point? What are you trying to figure out for this setting? And this one teacher said, I'm trying to figure out how to do uh, note taking. She really felt like in her style of class, Mm -hmm. she needed to instruct the kids. She needed them to take notes at the same time. And she needed to then be able to see if they took the notes. Now, I, I long I long ago gave up on the idea of trying to convince everybody to do everything in the classroom the same way because when she said that I was like I don't know I don't know if I completely agree with the strategies you're talking about here but I've given because we're all different and I think the kids benefit from that um, and I made some suggestions to her but I didn't even think about book creator that's a phenomenal point because if you have that library then you could access all of them mm-hmm. and your kids can put in whatever way they want to express their notes, drawings, pictures, Mm -hmm. they they could screenshot what what you're sharing in Google meet or whatever, and put it into their book. They could uh, record things. That's a fantastic idea for doing that. Yeah. I just love the management aspect that for me, when I'm doing, you know, similarly hosting professional development and want to give people some options to say like, this is how you are thinking about things now, here's a way to transfer this. And, you know, so the ease and efficiency aspect is definitely a part of it. Um, I hate to discount that because I think it it counts. It's counterproductive to ignore just how it's important to save time and make things easier for everyone. Right. Um, And so there's that piece, but then just being able to hear from students, give them that choice and set them up with some examples. um, There's just a lot that you can do uh, within that space. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I think the other tool that I would add in here, not that Seesaw and Book Creator aren't phenomenal ones for this. I think the other tool that I would add in for the same reason, kind of it's a, it fits in that same group of tools is Padlet. Um, because Padlet, again, your students can put in all of those different things. Um, I think what's interesting here about the tools that we've named here, Seesaw and Book Creator and Padlet, uh, and and we mentioned Pear Deck and, and Nearpod as, as mm-hmm. kind of Pear Deck's counterpart, um, they're all very different tools. So it kind of depends on when you want to hear from your students, Mm -hmm. how do you want that to work? What kind of format are you looking for? Is it just for one class period? Is it during a lesson? Is it over the course of a school year? Um, What what kinds of things are they going to be expressing to you? And it's different Mm -hmm. in all of our different classrooms. So it's nice to kind of have these different options depending on the direction you want to go with it. Does that make sense? 
Definitely. And, you know, I had an episode of my podcast earlier this year where I think the title was something like my number one ed tech tip for teachers. And it kind of comes back to this idea of choose something that's open ended that you can invest your time and your energy in and your students' time and energy in that you can use in lots of different ways. So maybe it's an ebook tool um, where you might have students publish different things, right? That's a kind of a choose your own adventure or a blank mm-hmm. canvas. Um, same thing with video creation tools or web publishing tools. Right? So if you can kind of really look at what your big goals are for the year, like you mentioned, what kind of core features you're going to need in order to truly hear from different students and find something that is flexible, a blank canvas, you know, most bang for your buck. Um, I think that's a really powerful way to, to make the most of your time when you're kind of maybe overwhelmed with all the different options from a tech integration perspective. Yeah, that's a great point. I think that's why like educators love a tool like Google Slides, because Uh it was approachable for them to learn how to do it. And they learned it years ago, most educators as a presentation tool, but then they keep leveling it up by finding different uses for it. And it's not overwhelming because they're just adding new uses to the same tool. So you're right. If you adopt a new tool like Book Creator or like Seesaw, then it can become your ed tech tool that you use all year long. It could be in Book Creator the way you assess. It could be the way that they take notes. It could be the way that you collaborate between students. You you could potentially use it for kind of all of the things. And Mm -hmm. and if, if you were um if you're deliberate about what it was you were trying to achieve when you pick that tool you might have just learned one tech tool that that kind of sustains you for the whole school year essentially right Definitely. And, you know, we do that being deliberate, having that level of intention. Slides is such a great example um, for all the reasons you just mentioned. And sometimes when I talk um, about journaling, for example, right, Mm -hmm. getting kids in, having them share in lots of different ways, um, I'll talk about that as the big idea, but then I'll show some different tools to make it happen, right? And slides is almost always on my list for whatever the thing might be Mm -hmm. because it is a space where many teachers have a level of confidence Mm -hmm. and there's so much you can do with it, right? So you could set up a template for journals, do a forced copy or a shared copy in Google Classroom. Everyone's got the same template for their journal. And then you can see everyone as they make their progress with something like that, there's workarounds, right? For the voice edition, kids might use voice typing. They might pull mm-hmm. in a screenshot from somewhere else, right? So there's still that level of flexibility and choice to make sure you can hear from everyone. And in order to hear from everyone, you've got to keep things organized. So sometimes embracing that spot that you're already using um, supersedes any great feature that another tool might have. That's a good point. I, I often push, especially a, a, maybe a novice tech using educator towards just picking a tool and trying it because that helps us identify what we need. You know, so maybe if you're comfortable with slides and you want to hear from your students and you try out slides, you might then figure out like, boy, I really wish there was a way for kids to add audio or boy, I really wish this was easier to share with parents. And then as you identify what, what pain points there are there maybe, or what improvements you could, you know, seek to make, then you might go, okay, book creators one for me or oh okay seesaw is one for me or padlet's one for one for me or maybe i stick with google slides but sometimes when we try things out we find out you know what what direction we actually want to take and you kind of don't know until you start kind of adventuring with it if that makes sense Exactly, right? We're all guilty of the you don't know what you don't know (laughs) type of piece, right? So I think going into spaces with that open mind, um, starting to do that deep dive and figure out, you know, what's missing here? What do I wish was here? Well, maybe I'm not the first person to wish this. Mm. And so where can I go to to find that that resource that's going to check that box? Right. And and knowing that your your needs might be different from somebody else's needs with it. And like you said, you don't know what you don't know. And you might not know that audio doesn't fit your style or or whatever. Mm-hmm. Like what like that's just an example there. Of course we we like the audio being there because it gives the kids more options. But as you explore one way of doing things, you kind of find out what way works best for you and your learners. Right? Definitely. Oh. 
Wow. Well, thank you for this, for, for being on today, Monica. You shared so many awesome things, so much cool stuff. Um, everybody's going to now tweet to you and Instagram comment to you and tell you their favorite Bill Murray movies, I think. Yes, They're going to let I you know if, <laughs> if you were wrong about, about Groundhog Day. There are going to be some people naming it. There's going to be some, you're going to get some Caddyshack, I think, in your uh, in your email inbox. People are going to be like, Caddyshack's the best with the a <laughs> gift of him, uh, Cinderella story. <laughs> I'm all for it. Yeah, get those re- movie wrecks coming. <laughs> nice, nice. All right, Monica. Well, thank you so much for being on today. Thank you for having me. Wow. Isn't Monica awesome? So much wisdom in regards to educational technology. I hope that you'll go check out her podcast, her blog, and her books. They are well worth it. Let's review some of the stuff that we discussed. First up, Monica shared about how hearing from a maximum number of students requires giving kids choice and agency and options so that they're willing to share their voice and are able to do it effectively. She also talked about removing barriers so that more students can participate. And it kind of goes along the same lines. The first tool that she shared for doing this is a favorite of mine as well, Seesaw. I always say that Seesaw is kind of like Google Classroom mixed with a digital portfolio tool and a parent communication tool. And it's nice because it has so many different ways that students can express themselves. Pictures and videos and drawings and videos of their drawings and text and links and files and audio. And then combine all those things too so we could see their thinking, we could see their reflections on their thinking. And not only are we hearing from our students, we're giving them different modes to do so to express their are thinking so that we truly are hearing from them. Her second option on the same lines was to use Book Creator because it also provides students with many options for sharing uh, their thinking and their learning. In the show notes, I've got a link to a blog post of mine that goes over all of those Book Creator options. The, the uh, link is titled 16 plus um, types of uh, media that you can embed in a book creator uh, book. I mean, there are so many different things you can put in there. And along the lines with what Monica said, because students have so many options, they're more likely to effectively um, express themselves so that we can understand their thinking and hear from them and, and assess their learning. I also mention on the same lines, how Padlet can provide a similarly wide array of expression options. And finally, we talked about how this can also be done with familiar tools like Google Slides. They might not have quite as many options, but because they're familiar, at least they're comfortable for you and the students to use. Woo, so much good stuff. I hope you are gonna go back and take some notes, look in the show notes, find some of that stuff, follow Monica, check it out. So much good information there. Okay, last but certainly not least, time for my favorite part of the show, which is the celebration of the adjacent possible. Adjacent possible is the idea that wherever you go, whatever you do, whatever you try, whoever you talk to, whoever you listen to, opens you up to new adjacent possibilities. What's possible for you is what you expose yourself to. In other words, what you're adjacent to. And by exposing yourself to more, more becomes possible for you. And those connections and discussions between me and you and you and you over there, between duct tapers, between educators, between us and Monica, those things open up our adjacent possibilities. So today we're going to expand our adjacent possible with two items. So first up, we've got Jay Strumwasser, who earned himself some duct taper swag. Sorry, by the way, Jay, that I haven't sent it yet, but it's, it's, it'll be on its way soon, I promise, for being the second person to send me a message on SpeakPipe. And you know what? I feel like I like the feeling of giving stuff away, even though I haven't actually packed the envelope and sent it to Jay. I like, I, I'm, I'm looking forward to that feeling. So if you would like some educational duct tape stickers and pins and a keychain and some GIF or GIF stickers, or both. How about both? Head over to the SpeakPipe page like Jay did, and I'll send swag to the next three people to respond. So I owe some to Carmen, who was first, and Jay, who was second, and the next three people who respond, I'll send some too. You could just share a message or some feedback like Jay did, or you can ask a question like we heard Carmen do in the last episode. Let's check out Jay's message now. Hey, Jake. Jay Stromwasser, EdTech Jay. Just want to let you know that you are the reason that I was reinvigorated in using education technology. I hit a point in my life where I needed to uh, think about things differently, and listening to your podcast made me think that way. So thanks so much, and I owe it to you. It was great seeing you in Philadelphia. Perhaps we could do that once again. 
Have a great one. Thank you for that, Jay. I think that he's probably overstating my impact and understating his own awesomeness, but I do really, really appreciate the kind words, Jay. Thank you so much for sharing that. Uh, really made my night when I got that message and tuned into it. A reminder, head to speakpipe.com slash edu duct tape to leave your own message. And if you're one of the next three, I'll get some swag headed your way. Our second item is a question that I got on Twitter. So let me head over to the Immersive Reader Chrome extension to read this one for us. It comes from Mary Ann D, who is at mad4cle on Twitter, and she tweeted this to me on March 5th. Here it goes. Take it away. Unofficial Immersive Reader Chrome extension. Here we go. Just learned we have a donor who wants to fund STEM activities. I'm in AK4 building, and we have separate funds for our new design lab. What do we put on the wish list? Any recommendations? So first off, I get questions like this a lot on Twitter, and they are incredibly hard because it's really dependent on your goals. I'm, I'm more than happy to share uh, a list of things that I like and that I've heard good things about, but you can't just buy those things um, and, and assume that they're right for your situation because everybody's situation is different. So you've got to kind of think about what it is you're trying to do. Are you trying to use these STEM activities and tools and resources academically, or is it meant to be? use during free time? Is it meant to directly support uh, student learning goals or indirectly support them, like maybe filming videos about class concepts? Or is it really just meant to be about exploring different STEM things, which actually Marianne said something in one of the tweet replies that makes me think that it really is meant to be kind of an ancillary thing that supports the student's growth and interest in STEM and doesn't directly pertain to academics. I'm sure it'd be nice if it did, but it doesn't sound like that's their goal, but it's very important to think about those things. It's also important to think about, are are, are you seeking buy-in from anybody? And, and if so, who? Are you, are you seeking buy-in from your teachers, your administrators, your students, your school board, your parents, your community? Who is the audience for this project? And who needs to give it a thumbs up? You need to align your purchasing power to your audience and your goals. If your audience is your school board and you know that your school board prioritizes, I don't know, like test scores and uh, student achievement, and you end up with lots of students who are interested in coding, that's fantastic that they're interested in coding, but your school board might not be feeling great about that afterwards because they might not see any impact where they want to see it. Now, I'm not saying that your school board is in the right, but you've got to think about what who who is it that you're looking for the thumbs up from, and you've got to calibrate what you're trying to do appropriately to make that happen. Uh, a, a story from a previous role of mine, um, I was working uh, in, a, in my district to help a uh, develop a digital fabrication space. And the goal of the space, one of the big goals, one of the main overarching goals was to support academic goals. So it was meant to be a digital fabrication space that was used a lot in the regular classrooms. It had some uses outside of regular class stuff, student passion projects and students just making things, students learning how to use the technology and things like that. But we really envisioned it supporting acquisition of academic goals in the regular classrooms. But we didn't ask any teachers for any input. And we didn't ask any teachers if they would use it. And that was a big mistake because we did not get buy-in or opinions or sign-on or anything like that from the people who was a main part of our audience and who were, we were depending on to make it a success. And it, they, we didn't even know if they wanted it, right? Also, uh, on a similar um, uh, plane, uh, maybe it's a student-focused space, which it sounds like Mariana kind of is, then you better get student input. Just like we should have gotten teacher input, you should get student input. Um, and then once you decide all that stuff, I also like to think about the fact that easy early wins draw in the people you're trying to get in. So um, in the first episode or first season of, of the Educational Duct Tape podcast, Jamie Shanter was on and Jamie at the time was running a makerspace at the school she she was at. I'm, I have to apologize. I'm not sure if Jamie's still there and still runs that makerspace or not. But she was telling the story in the episode about how one of the things they did was they started kids on using a button maker or a pin maker 
because it was really easy to do. It was really inexpensive. It didn't take a lot of instruction. The kids loved the pins they were making on it. And then other kids saw the pins. So the kids would come in. They'd only take like 20 minutes in there or whatever it took. They'd make their pins. They'd leave excited. They might experience some other things or be exposed to some other things in there and be like, ooh, I'm going to come back and try that next time. And then their friends would see their pins and then they would go like, oh, I want to go make some pins. So something like that that brings in an early win and then can potentially hook some students or some teachers or whoever it might be, those are great things too. So for K to four, um, obviously I would advocate for Legos. I'd advocate for magnetiles. And my son has a set of blocks right now that are like magnetiles. I forget the name of them. Are they Newton blocks or something like that? Or Picasso tiles? I think they're Picasso tiles, um, but cars drive on them. He, he loves all of those magnetic building blocks. They're an absolute hit in the Miller house. Um, also a big fan of having makerspace stuff like duct tape and cardboard and scissors and paper and things like that there. Need lots of scissors if you're going to get cardboard and lots of heavy-duty scissors. Um, 3D printers, everybody wants to say, oh, get a 3D printer. Um, 3D printers are really cool, but they can also be really fickle and really difficult to work with. So I don't typically advocate for 3D printers at the top of my list for that kind of situation. One thing I would advocate for are robotics tools. Um, my kids have had good experience with Ozobots. I've had good experience in the past in uh, robotics clubs using the le- different Lego robots. Uh, my kids did a camp through a local university about MakeBlock MBot robots recently, which they really enjoyed. And there's also the MBot uh, actual like circuit boards, or they're not circuit boards, I'm not sure what they're called. I've never used them, but it's built on the same uh, same kind of program. Those have, have been really well reviewed by some people that I respect. Uh, my son, who's um, currently first grader, has had a Botley robot since he was either in pre- preschool or kindergarten. So for the primary kids, Botley is a really good robot to learn basic coding. Uh, my son is also a big Lego guy, and he really enjoyed just getting a set of Lego Technic motors. Um, not even a kit, just like a set of motors that he can attach to other Lego blocks and build with. And he, it really kind of ramped up his understanding of how he might use motors. Um, I'm a big fan of Makey Makeys. Uh, I also have had good experiences with Kano uh, in the past where you kind of build your own computer and learn how to code it and things like that. And then we got some responses to the tweet, or Marianne got some responses to the tweet from some other people. Paul Shercliffe, who's one of my go-to guys for STEM and Makerspace and PBL, uh, provided a, a great list of things, including LEDs and watch batteries and copper tape, a great way for kids to learn some of the basics of circuits and electrical engineering. Uh, He also recommended a Cricut or a Cameo for 2D design. Um, I I should also point out, if you're getting a Cricut or any kind of vinyl cutter, um, consider getting a heat press too. Kids would love to make t-shirts for sure. They probably can't run the heat press in grades K to four, but that doesn't mean they can't make something that you oversee them using on the heat press. Um, If you're thinking about videos, obviously a green screen screen or a green tarp or a green wall or something like that. Uh, I'm a huge fan of building Rube Goldberg machines. So if you can get a bunch of different parts and things like that for Rube Goldberg machines, that'd be great. Uh, Mrs. Ms. Deem on Twitter. I apologize if I'm not pronouncing that right. Recommended a few things that I know, including Strawbees and Osmo. I've never used Strawbees, but I think they look awesome. My kids have Osmos and we love them. But she also recommended a bunch of things that I don't know. Uh, Matata, 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 <laughs> Matata Lab, uh, Imagination Playground, Unruly Splats, and Cubetto. I don't know any of those things, but I'm going to have to check them out. And Liz Gallo recommended Edison Robot and her Why Maker project, which provides STEM teacher training. So if you're interested in some STEM teacher training, look up Liz and Why Maker. I think she's at Why Maker on Twitter, actually. So if you think I left something out that Marianne should know about, please click the link for Marianne's tweet in the show notes and add your two cents. And if you've got a question, tweet it to me at Jake Miller Tech or email it to me, jakemillertech at gmail.com. Add it in the Facebook group. Submit it on the show's Flipgrid at flipgrid.com slash edu duct tape. Password is edu duct tape or record a message on my SpeakPipe page, speakpipe.com slash edu duct tape. And that's speak, S-P-E-A-K, pipe, P-I-P-E. And remember, the next three SpeakPipers get some swag in the mail, so it's worth it. Go do that. And finally, before I wrap the show up, here's your homework for this week. I'd like you to find an educator named Steve and tell him about this show. I've done some hard-hitting data analysis on the show's listenership, and 
Well, we're underperforming on educators named Steve. We're reaching less than half of the market average of Steve's listening to podcasts. That's really, really frustrating how few Steve's are listening um, in the market for podcasts. 3% of listeners are named Steve, and we're at about 1.2%. And I just need some more Steve's. Can you believe that? So help me out. Find me some Steve's. Guys, find an educator named Steve. Tell him about the podcast. He needs to listen. It'll help me. Hopefully, it'll help him. We'll all be happy. Okay, that does it for today's episode. Check the show notes for details about signing up for my newsletter, joining the Duct Tapers Facebook group, inquiring about having me speak at an upcoming event, getting some podcast stickers, and more. As always, as a parent, I'm grateful for the work you do. And as an educator, I'm proud of your dedication to lifelong learning. And I will see you guys in a fortnight. Have a good one, everybody. Thank you for listening to the Educational Duct Tape Podcast. Please visit eduducttape.com to join the discussion, share possible topics, inquire about being a guest, or contact Jake. And remember, duct is spelled with a T, not a quack quack K.